Welcome to Holocaust, Welcome to Holocaust Histories, Holocaust. the podcast featuring mind-boggling stories from the Holocaust, remarkable tales of heroism and horror that are guaranteed to amaze you. Season 1. In the prime of their lives and careers, boxers' dreams are snatched and replaced by nightmares. Boxing is no longer for money and pride, but for bread scraps and survival. Fighting now takes place in concentration camps. The winner lives another day. The loser is killed. Dive into the astonishing stories of boxers' resilience and courage in the face of incomprehensible terrors. Each episode features a boxer with a different nationality and a unique experience during the Holocaust. Some will live, some will die. They will all fight to survive. Thanks for listening to this episode. Please rate, subscribe, and tell a friend. You can send any questions, corrections, and comments to holocausthistories at gmail.com. This episode contains graphic descriptions and sensitive subject matters. Listener discretion advised. It's difficult in times like these. Ideals, dreams, and cherished hopes rise within us, only to be crushed by grim reality. It's a wonder I haven't abandoned all my ideals. They seem so absurd and impractical. Yet I cling to them because I still believe, in spite of everything, people are truly good at heart. And Frank. Victor Perez traveled from the Jewish district of Tunisia to the metropolitan city of Paris to pursue his dream of becoming an internationally known boxer. He quickly became a celebrity throughout Europe. He dated a famous French actress, forming one of the biggest celebrity couples in the 1930s. Victor would quickly go from riches to rags with the onset of World War II. He would endure torturous conditions as a prisoner of the infamous Monowitz concentration camp, a labor subcamp of Auschwitz, built by German pharmaceutical company IG Farben and commanded by SS boxing fanatic Heinrich Schwartz. Victor would box against other inmates. The winner got extra food rations while the loser was killed. This is a story of bravery and resilience. The story of Victor Perez. Perez. Let's travel back to 1911, an eventful year. The first old age home is opened. The first International Women's Day is held, as is the first Indianapolis 500. Clarence DeMar wins his first of seven Boston marathons. IBM and Chevrolet are founded, as is the NAACP. Also in 1911, Machu Picchu is discovered. The world's first combat aerial bombing mission is completed. Sun Yat-sen is elected the first president of the Republic of China. And Marie Curie receives her second Nobel Prize, this time in chemistry for her work with radioactivity. A lesser-known event also took place that year. On March 20th, 1911, Victor Perez was born in Dar el Bergana, Tunisia, a French colony established in 1881. It was the Jewish quarter of Tunis, the capital city of Tunisia. It had a modest Jewish population with around 20,000 Jews at the time of Victor's birth, about 7% of the population. Victor's parents were Sephardic Jews named Komza Nizard and Makluf René Perez. Victor had an older brother Benjamin, a younger brother Albert, and two younger sisters, Betty and Margaret. Sephardic Jews originated in Hispanic countries that had a diaspora in the late 1400s. During World War I, Tunisian Jews were hunted by French and Arab civilians. Victor hid under his bed while Benjamin held on to their mother. Victor's love of boxing started at a young age. His idol was Senegalese boxing champ, Louise Fall, aka the Battling Siki. Fall was the light heavyweight champion of the world, only to be shot dead in 1925. In 1926, at the age of 14, Victor started training with his older brother Benjamin. Benjamin had already taken up boxing. He got the nickname The Kid. Victor and Benjamin trained at the Maccabi Boxing Club in Tunis. One day, members of the club were choosing nicknames. Victor and fellow Maccabi boxing member Edward Zerbib wanted the same nickname, Young. They agreed to fight for the name. Victor won. Victor was 5 foot 1, weighing 110 pounds. He had exceptional footwork in the ring. 
Despite a later start at boxing than his brother, he was perceived a better fighter. Benjamin left for Paris to work as a sparring partner for decent money. He sent a letter to Victor that said, Here there are plenty of pretty women. You can train with the best managers, meet well-known people, athletes, and artists while taking an evening walk in Montparnasse or Montmartre. Victor's skills were evident in Tunis, and he was often written about in sports sections of the newspaper. He decided to join his brother in Paris around 1927. He faked a parental signature needed to leave and departed with his friend Jojo. Victor worked as a shoe salesman while training at the Alhambra Boxing Club. It was there he was noticed and quickly recruited by French boxing manager Leon Bellier. Bellier became Victor's manager. Victor made his professional boxing debut on February 4, 1928, beating a young Italian boxer with ease. Victor went undefeated in his first 10 matches in Paris, eventually losing in the 10th round to Leo Hermel. His popularity drastically increased. Victor proudly wore the Jewish Star of David on his boxing trunks throughout his career. Outside of the ring, he was quite a fashionista, sporting elegant tailored suits. Victor's first attempt at France's flyweight championship was on February 8, 1930. It resulted in a fourth round loss to Henry Olivia. Just over a year later, on June 4, 1931 in Paris, Victor defeated Valentin Algelman in 15 rounds to win the French flyweight title. On October 24, 1931, at Paris's famed Palais des Sports, Victor fought prominent American boxer Frankie Gennaro in front of 16,000 spectators, see, including Benjamin. There is in their side. Seems almost puny next to the giant he's about to fight. Sweat beating shoulders and forehead. Crowd waits tensely. Round one coming up. There it is. So the big fight begins. He's never still for an instant. Bobbing and weaving around. It looks like a test of speed against power. Round two and the bell sounds again. And down he goes. Victor knocked him out in the second round and was crowned the champion. He was the youngest French citizen to win a world flyweight boxing title. Le Merois de Sports wrote, Boxing at dizzying speed. The little Tunisian young Perez kills in five minutes the American veteran Frankie Gennaro and thus becomes at 20 and a half the indisputable world champion of the flyweights. This was a monumental moment for Victor, who quickly became an idol amongst Tunisians, Jews, French, and ultimately most of Europe. A victory celebration was held in Paris, where he met and started relations with many young women, including British-German actress Lillian Harvey. He dated famous French actress Marie Bellon, and the two quickly became one of the most famous couples in 1930s Europe. They cruised the streets of Paris in an American-made convertible. Victor returned to Tunis to visit his parents. He was greeted at the port by over 100,000 people, including his sisters, his parents, and the president of the Jewish community. Victor was awarded the Order of Glory, the highest honor in Tunisia at the time. Victor went back to Paris and continued to date Marie Bellon. He spent money liberally at fine dining restaurants, cafes, casinos, cabarets, and on expensive jewelry. Victor was on top of the world. October 31, 1931, just over a year after being crowned champion, Victor lost to boxer Jackie Brown in 12 rounds. The fight took place at Bellevue Casino in Manchester, England. Benjamin, Marais, and Jojo were all in attendance. February 19, 1934, Victor fought for the bantamweight title versus the legendary boxer, Panama L. Brown. Victor was 10 inches shorter, yet managed a competitive 15-round fight. He lost by a unanimous decision. Around the same time, Mireille had rejected a marriage proposal from Victor. For years, they had been having relationship difficulties. Victor's boxing career declined at this point as her acting career blossomed. Her fame skyrocketed in 1937 with her leading role in Pepe Le Moco. At this time, Victor had also spent all of his earnings and his investments into a cafe in Tunis that was not paying off. He had also bought an unfinished hotel on credit in Tunis which went bankrupt. The building and his car were seized. Marais split with Victor, saying she wanted freedom, and she also said she could not be with a Tunis Jew. She then dated French singer-actor Tino Rossi. Victor was in a Berlin hotel waiting to fight Austrian boxer Ernst Weiss. It was a sleepless night for Victor, as Kristallnacht had occurred the night before, the pogrom of Jews in Germany by the Nazis. 
Victor lost the match and was heckled with anti-Semitic slurs. The crowd spit and threw objects at him. Victor flew back to Paris immediately after. His last professional bout was on December 7, 1938. He ended with a record of 92 wins with 28 knockouts. He had 26 losses and 15 draws. As Victor's career concluded, Nazism and fascism rapidly grew. Anti-Jewish race laws were implemented across Europe. World War II officially started on September 1st, 1939. You will now hear a statement by the Prime Minister. This country is at war. Germany attacked France on May 10th, 1940. And just over a month later, on June 14th, France was under Nazi occupation. Victor's brother Benjamin was still in France at the time. Benjamin feared for his safety and planned to leave immediately back to Tunisia. Victor, the optimist of the two, remained in Paris against his brother's will. Back in Tunisia, the population was about 1 million, with about 90,000 Jews. The ruler was Ahmed Bey, an 8-year-old man responsible for passing several anti-Jewish laws. Ahmed was the ruler from 1929 until his death in 1942. Tunisia was the only one of the three occupied North African colonies, Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia, to have direct contact with the German troops. Tunisia was occupied by Germany for approximately six months, from November 1942 until May 1943. Much like Tunisia, Algeria and Morocco suffered at the hands of the French Vichy, an authoritarian anti-Semitic regime who collaborated with Nazi Germany. Guido Montefiore, a Jew in Tunis at the time, wrote in his diary, I want to say that last night was quite noisy because the bombing began at 9 and did not stop for the entire night. Like everyone, I stayed awake all night. Yigal Halamit, who was 12 during Nazi-occupied Tunis, said, I remember that there was almost no food. I would stand every day for hours in a line in order to get bread. Our neighbors were kicked out of their home, my uncle was taken hostage, and overall we lived with twice the fear. On the one hand, the Germans, and on the other, the aerial bombings by the Allied forces that devastated the city. We had to go to sleep in a store with a basement because there were no shelters then. The Germans took all the Jews over the age of 18 to work camps, among them my two older brothers. The Vichy were responsible for anti-Jewish legislation that began in France on July 16, 1940. Around 6,000 Jews had their nationality revoked just a month after the Vichy took power. A law passed that required Jews to be registered with the Vichy regime. They were forced to report to the police station. Victor refused and did not report. On October 3, 1940, a law was passed to exclude Jews from the army, the press, and all other commercial, industrial, and civil services. The following day, the Vichy passed another law, which allowed for the immediate internment of foreign Jews. This resulted in 40,000 Jews being sent to different concentration camps. The laws went into effect in Tunisia on November 30, 1940. One work camp in Tunis was described by a prisoner. 500 people were given only five water bottles, and everyone got one bun for dinner, each worth one penny. They spent the entire night outside, under the hood of the sky in pouring rain. Simply horrible. Barbarianism that fits the 15th century, and we are living in the 20th. By mid-1941, half of the Tunisian Jewish population had no income. Jews were forbidden from having radios and changing residence. They were restricted in the hours they could go out in public and prohibited from cafes and restaurants. Victor pretended to be a Spaniard and entered the places he was not allowed. On May 29, 1942, on the advice of Nazi propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels, Adolf Hitler ordered Jews in occupied Paris to wear a yellow Star of David. The star was to be sewn onto clothing. Victor had proudly worn the Jewish symbol on his boxing shorts during his career. He was now forced to wear it as an identification and humiliation tool by the Nazis. Just 20 days later in Tunisia, Ahmed Bey died and was replaced by his cousin, Monsef Bey. This transition of power was a huge turning point for Tunisian Jews. Monsef Bey was known as the protector of the Jews, unlike his cousin Ahmed. Monsef's rule started on June 19, 1942. He wanted the independence of Tunisia 
and was also sympathetic to the Jews. Monsef signed against three decrees. The first was the requirement of Jews to wear the yellow star. The second was the establishment of work camps and mandatory forced labor. Thirdly, Monsef rejected the legislation that aimed to financially destabilize the Jewish economy by preventing them from working and making money. He awarded the Order of Glory to about 20 Jews during these times as well. In 1942, the Allies organized an attack on Vichy-occupied North Africa. It was named Operation Torch. They planned to enter Algeria and Morocco and quickly moved to Tunisia. On November 9, 1942, Tunisia was invaded by Nazi Germany with the aid of the Vichy regime. When they arrived in Tunisia, they immediately arrested five leaders of the Jewish community, who were lucky to be released the next day at the request of Monsef. German Colonel Walter Rauf rounded up 3,000 Jews and transported them to a forced labor camp. Tunisian Jews were detained and forced to work at labor camps, where they often worked in intense desert heat. They constructed railroads, built factories, and cleared airfields. Over 40 labor camps were constructed in Tunisia that imprisoned around 5,000 Jews. 12-year-old Tunisian boy Alouche Trebelzi wrote a poem based on the conditions at the time. Barefoot and with torn clothes, we remained fasting for four days, and the tears flow from my eyes because the bombs came raining down. Because of the bombs I was confused, and I did not know what to do. The lice are burdened upon me, and my hands are injured from shoveling. They will enter the houses and torture you. They will frighten you in your sleep. They will frighten you with shells and shots. They continue to sound the alarms and spot the planes. There are those dead from direct hits, and there are dead in the trenches, and there are dead in the shelters. To the others, they rob their apartments, and they remain cast off in the streets. They sleep on the land great and small, and their belongings case out in the street. Be gracious, I pray thee, my God. Jews were kidnapped, beaten in the streets, and synagogues were burned down. Homes and stores were confiscated and raided. The Nazis seized whatever goods they wanted and made arbitrary arrests. Jews were fined for being, and I quote, part of the international Jewish conspiracy. On November 8, 1942, the day before being invaded, Monsef received two letters, one from U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt, also known as FDR, which requested passage for American and Allied forces through Tunisia. The second letter came from the Vichy regime leader, Philippe Pétain. He wrote that Tunisia must align their attitude with mainland France. Monsef responded to FDR with a letter dated November 13, 1942. The events of the last few days impose on us the duty of sparing our people the sufferings of war. Conscious of our responsibility and anxious to observe an equal attitude towards the belligerents, we believe that we must solemnly formulate the wish of our country to remain outside the conflict. Monsef had told FDR that Tunisia was to remain neutral, not allowing them the passage that was requested. Monsef expected Nazi and Vichy forces to read the letter, so he sent a secret letter to FDR on November 11th. The letter formally aligned Tunisia with the US and the Allied troops. Nevertheless, it appeared as Victor's brother Benjamin had made the right decision to move back to Tunisia, which had improved for the Jewish people since Ahmed was replaced by Monsef. France, on the other hand, was becoming more anti-Semitic and fascist. In Tunisia, by November 10th, 1942, Germany had reinforced their army with 100 aircrafts. Two days later, on November 12th, they sent 15,000 troops and 176 tanks to Tunisia. A battle was near. On November 22nd, a deal was made that put occupied North Africa on the side of the Allies. The war commenced. The battle raged and both sides built up their forces for the next few months. More big General Sherman-type tanks roll up as the advance continues. Tank warfare erupted. As 1942 concluded, numerous anti-Jewish events had occurred in France. The SS Lieutenant Colonel Adolf Eichmann secretly ordered the deportation of French Jews to Auschwitz. The SS were the secret police division of the Nazis. 13,000 Jews, 4,000 of which were children, were sent to Auschwitz. Jews were banned from all main streets, movie theaters, libraries, parks, gardens, restaurants, cafes, and other public places. 
In 1942, Marie Bellon fell in love with Beryl Desbach, a Nazi officer. She reported Victor to the Vichy regime. Victor was detained on September 21, 1943. He was sent to Drancy concentration camp. He was recognized by inmates and guards as a famous boxer. He was given the nickname Champion. On October 7, 1943, Victor was transported by bus to Bobigny train station. Three days later, he was part of Transport 60, a group of a thousand prisoners shipped to Monowitz concentration camp. It took four days to arrive at the camp. There was no food or water on board the trains. Monowitz was located in Monowitz, Poland. Victor arrived to Monowitz by cattle cart on the morning of October 10, 1943. It was about 5 degrees Celsius and 40 degrees Fahrenheit. It was misty and lightly rainy. Prisoners were pulled off the carts and told to go either left or right. One direction meant immediate death, the other meant being put to work. Victor was recognized on the way to Monowitz as well as inside of the camp. His celebrity status boosted the morale of some prisoners, giving them a link to their life prior to the war. Elie Wiesel was one of millions of Jews sent to Auschwitz. An SS guard told him when he arrived, There's a long road of suffering ahead of you, but don't lose courage. You've already escaped the gravest danger. Selection. So now muster your strength and don't lose heart. Drive out despair and you will keep death away from yourselves. Hell is not for eternity. Help one another. It is the only way to survive. Auschwitz was a massive concentration camp and death camp that held about 40 subcamps within. Some of the camps were solely execution zones while others were used for forced labor. Auschwitz began operations in 1940. The main camp was about 150 acres, but including the subcamps, it was about 500. 1.3 million people were sent to Auschwitz. About 85% of them were killed. Jews made up for approximately 960,000 of the dead. The others included Europeans from opposing countries, mentally challenged people, Jehovah's Witnesses, political prisoners, Sinti and Roma, or the Gypsies as the Nazis referred to them, homosexuals, and Soviet prisoners. Around 90% of Auschwitz prisoners were sent to the gas chambers and killed upon arrival. Monowitz was one of the 40 subcamps within Auschwitz. It was the third largest. It was also known as Auschwitz III. Monowitz was a labor camp that was used by IG Farben, a German chemical, military, and pharmaceutical conglomerate. In 1941, IG Farben made a deal with the Nazis. They wanted to use Jews for slave labor to build an industrial complex called Buna Werke. There they would produce synthetic rubbers. IG Farben bought the land from the Nazis at a low price after it had been seized from the Jews and Poles. Elsewhere in Poland, German authorities removed Jews from their homes, which were subsequently sold to IG Farben as housing for company employees. The valuables in the homes were taken by the Nazis. IG Farben supplied the Nazis with most of their explosives and weaponry. They also produced the poison gas that was used in gas chambers, known as Zyklon B. Zyklon B was a deadly cyanide-based pesticide. It was responsible for killing around a million Jews. April 1941, prisoners at Monowitz were exhausted and hungry while forced to unload 200-pound bags of cement. Work consisted of leveling the grounds, digging drainage ditches, laying cables, and building roads. Just enough watery soup and bread was given so they could work. July 21st, an outbreak of typhus occurred at Auschwitz. IG Farben decided to turn the barracks camp over to the SS to house the prisoners. The first prisoners arrived on October 26th, and by early November there were approximately 2,000. The population of Monowitz grew from 3,500 in December 1942 to over 6,000 by the first half of 1943. By 1944, the prisoner population was over 11,000. The life expectancy of Jewish workers at Buna Werke was three to four months. IG Farben management insisted on removing sick and exhausted workers from the camp. Those deemed unfit for work were sent to the Auschwitz gas chambers. Fritz Leuner Beta, prisoner number 68561, was one of the most popular singers and songwriters in Vienna in the 1920s and 30s. Fritz was Jewish and was sent to Monowitz in October 1942. On December 4th, he was going about his work when a group of SS and IG Farben directors passed by. 
One of the IG Farben directors pointed at Fritz and said, This Jewish swine could work a little faster. Another director replied, If they can't work, let them perish in the gas chamber. After the inspection was over, Fritz was pulled out of work and was beaten to death. On February 10, 1943, Gerard Maurer, responsible for the employment of concentration camp prisoners, promised IG Farben the arrival of another thousand prisoners. In exchange, IG Farben gave Maurer their incapable factory workers. Over 10,000 prisoners were sent to the main camp's hospital and killed by lethal injection of phenol to the heart. By 1943, IG Farben was manufacturing products worth 3 billion marks, with a net profit around 2 billion modern-day euros. They had around 165,000 slave laborers, including 30,000 Auschwitz prisoners. IG Farben's subsidiary company, Bayer Pharmaceuticals, was conducting medical experiments on Jewish prisoners. One experiment was testing an anesthetic. Bayer had 150 women sent from Auschwitz to its own facility. They paid 150 Reichmarks per prisoner. The camp had asked for 200, but Bayer said it was too expensive. All the test subjects died as a result of the experiment. A Bayer employee wrote Rudolf Hurst, the Auschwitz commander. In the letter, he stated, The transport of 150 women arrived in good condition. However, we were unable to obtain conclusive results because they died during the experiments. We would kindly request that you send us another group of women to the same number and at the same price. In Tunisia by March 1943, the Germans were slowly being defeated and their forces had dwindled. General Eisenhower, Allied commander in North Africa, visits General Patton's frontline headquarters as the combined Allied force bottle up the Nazis in the northeast corner of Tunisia. The Battle of Tunisia enters its final phase. Allied aircrafts patrolled the skies and naval destroyers the seas. General and leader of Operation Torch, Dwight Eisenhower, told his naval task force, Sink, burn, capture, destroy. Let nothing pass. On May 7, 1943, British troops entered and captured the capital city of Tunis. At the same time, American troops captured Bezert. A week later on May 14th, the remaining Nazi and Vichy in Tunisia completely surrendered. The greatest mass surrender of fully equipped troops in modern history. More than 230,000 German troops surrendered and became prisoners of war. On the same date, Monsef was abducted and forced on board a French Air Force plane. While in the air, he was read a deposition and removed from authority. The order came directly from the Vichy general. Henri Giraud. Monsef was deported to Algeria, where he died a couple years later on September 1, 1948, under house arrest. The casualties during the Tunisian campaign were problematic for Hitler. He had sent a large amount of resources to the losing battle. The German troops recorded 12,200 deaths. Over 16,000 Allied troops were killed. Germany's Air Force, the Luftwaffe, lost 41% of their aircrafts, with over 2,400 destroyed. Germany had also lost a key foothold, the Mediterranean shipping passages. Allied control of Mediterranean waters has made it possible to keep food and ammunition rolling right with the troops. The control of these waters by the Allies allowed for an invasion into Sicily, Italy. A victory parade was held in Tunis on May 20, 1943. General Eisenhower attended. About a month after Victor's arrival at Monowitz, the Nazis assigned Captain Heinrich Schwartz as the commander of the camp. He had 440 SS at his disposal. Schwartz happened to be a boxing fanatic, so when he found out one of his prisoners was a boxing champion, he was thrilled. He organized boxing matches in which inmates fought each other and fought SS guards. It was a form of entertainment for Schwartz and his men, who bet on the matches. The fights were held outdoors in the camp's main square. The fighters were given an extra portion of soup and bread, and they were spared from labor a few hours of the week to train at a boxing gym that Schwartz had built in a barrack. During his first fight, Victor was malnourished and exhausted from labor. His opponent was an SS guard who was twice his size. Schwartz had handpicked Victor's opponent and was ready to watch Victor get pummeled. Some of the prisoners were permitted to watch the fight. 
Victor's opponent was beating him badly when all of a sudden the prisoners in the crowd started to chant, Young, Young, Young. The encouragement sparked Victor, who quickly turned the fight around. He used what energy and strength he had and displayed his phenomenal footwork and powerful punches. He ended up winning the fight. Schwartz was shocked and outraged. He then decided prisoners would only fight other prisoners and not the SS. Victor fought 140 times, begrudgingly winning each fight as the loser was shot dead. He shared the extra bread he received from the winnings with his fellow prisoners. He made sure those who were on the verge of dying from starvation received a portion. Victor was placed in the camp's kitchen for work. This job was much more desirable than the more laborious construction work. It also provided him the opportunity for extra food. He stole oranges and soups and shared them with inmates. When asked by another prisoner why he did it, knowing if he was caught, he would be killed, he replied, A man can't live on his own. He lives to help others. Elie Wiesel described the inhumanity of forced starvation. Hunger is isolating. It may not and cannot be experienced vicariously. He who never felt hunger can never know its real effects, both tangible and intangible. Hunger defies imagination. It even defies memory. Hunger is felt only in the present. One day, a workman took a piece of bread out of his bag and threw it into a wagon. There was a stampede. Dozens of starving men fought each other to the death for a few crumbs. The German workmen took a lively interest in this spectacle. Victor was caught giving food to another inmate and was severely beaten. He was put in solitary confinement for 15 days with a bucket of water and a quarter ration of bread. His cell had no air or light and was filled with rats. When he was released, he was no longer allowed to work in the kitchen. He was now doing grueling outdoor work. In 1944, the Allies bombed Monowitz four separate times. Victor survived each bombing. It was the following year, on January 17, 1945, the Allied troops neared Auschwitz. The Nazis killed the weak prisoners and evacuated the camp. Those healthy enough were sent on a death march, Victor being amongst them. Death marches became commonplace towards the end of the war. The Nazis destroyed evidence of the atrocities committed at the camps, and they transferred prisoners further away from Allied invasion. The prisoners, already near death, attempted to walk incredibly long distances. They lacked clothing and footwear and had no food. They were often beaten along the way, and the weather conditions were abysmal. Victor was part of the largest death march of the Holocaust. Between January 17th and January 21st, 1945, approximately 56,000 prisoners were sent on a death march. Depending on the subcamp location they were to be transferred to, the march was around 36 miles, or 58 kilometers. The temperature at this time was around minus 20 degrees Celsius, or 4 degrees Fahrenheit. Most prisoners were sent to Laszlo, while others, like Victor, were sent to Gliwitz. Those who fell behind on the march were killed. January 21st, on the last day of the death march, Victor managed to scrounge up a piece of bread he found on the road. He was giving other prisoners pieces of the bread when an SS guard approached him and shot him twice in the head. Victor was dead at the age of 33. He was one of approximately 15,000 who died on this march. Just nine days after Monowitz was evacuated, it was liberated by the Soviet army. They shipped any useful equipment and valuable goods left behind at the camp back to Siberia. IG Farben destroyed evidence of their association with the Nazis in Auschwitz. In the spring of 1945, the company destroyed 15 tons of paperwork. The U.S. seized the company on November 30, 1945 for, and I quote, knowingly and prominently building up and maintaining German war potential. IG Farben was subsequently divided into four zones, the American, British, French, and Soviet. The U.S. 3rd Army Division, led by General Lucian Truscott, demolished one of the IG Farben factories with explosives. 200 tons of TNT do the trick. The U.S. government charged 24 directors of IG Farben with five counts of war crimes. The trial lasted just over a year, dating from August 27, 1947 to July 30, 1948. The grave charges in this case 
have not been laid before the tribunal casually or unreflectingly. The indictment accuses these men of major responsibility for visiting upon mankind the most searing and catastrophic war in modern history. It accuses them of wholesale enslavement, plunder, and murder. These are terrible charges. No man should underwrite them frivolously or vengefully or without deep and humble awareness of the responsibility which he thereby shoulders. There is no laughter in this case. Crimes with which these men are charged were not committed in rage or under the stress of sudden temptation. One does not build a stupendous war machine in a fit of passion, nor an Auschwitz factory during a passing spasm of brutality. What these men did was done with the utmost deliberation and would, I venture to surmise, be repeated if the opportunity should recur. There will be no mistaking the ruthless purposefulness with which the defendants embarked upon their course of conduct. In this arrogant and supremely criminal adventure, the defendants were eager and leading participants. Himmler, for a price, furnished the defendants with the miserable inmates of his camp, who slaved and died to build the Buna factory, and particularly the inevitable production of numerous byproducts for which some practical use was always being sought. Thirteen defendants were found guilty with sentences ranging between 18 months and eight years. However, all were cleared on the first count of waging war, and all received early releases. IG Farben started liquidating the company in 1952. They did not complete the liquidation until 2012. They eventually spun off into subsidiaries, including Bayer, AGFA, and BASF. IG Farben directors resumed working at these companies. For 60 years, IG Farben was criticized for not paying the compensation owed to the former concentration camp survivors. Instead, they dragged them through legal battles. Eventually, they were forced to pay the victims around 30 million Deutschmarks. This amounted to 5,000 Deutschmarks for each Jewish survivor. IG Farben declared bankruptcy, and many of the victims were not paid. Germany established a national compensation fund for the former prisoners, but IG Farben did not contribute to the fund. The company's annual meetings in Frankfurt, Germany were met with hundreds of protesters each year. Bayer acquired agrochemical and agricultural biotech company Monsanto in 2016. Bayer brands include Aleve, Elka Seltzer, Aspirin, and Claritin. Bayer, AGFA, and BASF all remain publicly traded companies. Elie Wiesel was evacuated from Auschwitz and sent to Buchenwald, where he would be liberated by the United States 3rd Army Division. He became a noted author and released the trilogy of acclaimed memoirs titled Night, Day, and Dawn. He won the 1986 Nobel Peace Prize and died on July 2, 2016 in Manhattan, New York at the age of 87. Weisel said before his death, What is abnormal is that I am normal, that I survived the Holocaust and went on to love beautiful girls, to talk, to write, to have toast and tea, and to live my life. That is what is abnormal. If we forget, the dead will be killed a second time, and then they are today's victims. As the war ended, Victor's brother Benjamin and the rest of his family waited for word from Victor. Time passed and they began to lose hope that Victor was still alive. Then one day in 1947, they had a knock on their door. It was a man who had survived the Holocaust. He had come from Canada to thank them and to tell them that Victor had saved his life in Auschwitz. After talking, the Perez's knew Victor was dead. In 1948, the Jewish population in Tunisia was 105,000. By 2017, that number had dropped to 1,500. In the 1960s, Victor's sister Margaret wanted to know more about her brother. She tried to speak with Belon, but she declined. She said she did not want to awaken the past. Victor was inducted into the International Jewish Sports Hall of Fame in 1986. Filmmaker Jacques Wanish made a movie in 2013 titled Victor Young Perez. A memorial for Victor can be found at the Borgel Jewish Cemetery in Tunis. Thanks for listening to this episode. Please rate, subscribe, and tell a friend. You can send any questions, corrections, and comments to holocausthistories at gmail.com. You can visit holocausthistories.com for more information.